21st, 2003, at the Atlanta History Center. We're interviewing veteran Margaret Saylor. This Put the Denny in it. Margaret Denny Saylor. Mm -hmm. And this is Francis Westbrook. And Mrs. Saylor, would you please spell your name and give us your date of birth? The entire name or just the last name? The, t the whole no, We understand Margaret, uh -huh. but... Danny and Sayla. Okay. D-E-N-N-Y. And my last name is P-S-A-I-L-A. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, what branch of the service were you in? Well, when I uh, first went in, I was in the W-A-A-C, which was the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps. Uh, after we had been in maybe six months, it became the W-A-C. They did away with the auxiliary. It was just Women's Army Corps. And where were you living before you enlisted? I was living in Louisville, Georgia, which is down near Augusta. It's a very small town. And um, that's where I was born, and that's where I had been living all along. And at what age did you enlist? Uh, well, I had to be 21 before they would let me enlist, but I started thinking about it before that, you know, as soon as Pearl Harbor happened and things like that. But I had to wait until I was 21 before they would take me, really. Was it Pearl Harbor that prompted you to enlist? What was the reaction in, in, on you and your town? Well, uh, to be perfectly frank, I had never heard of Pearl Harbor before. <clears throat> and um, what prompted me, so many people from my little small town, so many people, men and women, joined. Navy. Uh, these are women I'm talking about. There were a lot of them in the Navy, friends of mine, and some in Marine Corps, and in the Army, too. So I just went along, sort of. You were out of high school? <clears throat> mm-hmm. I had been working probably two years after high school, or more than that. I'd been out of high school since 1939. That's not too long. So you made the decision that you wanted to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you remember exactly what prompted you to do that? I'm sure a lot of people were interested in the law, but, but didn't actually take that step. Well, you know how young people get together and talk, and they sort of talk each other into things. Well, a real close friend of mine from grammar school on uh, said, why don't we join the Army? And I said, okay, we'll think about it. And we did. And we went. We joined together at Fort McPherson and went all the way to Daytona and went through training together. Then they separated us. And how did your family react? To they were not happy about it at all. My father particularly. But uh, after he got used to the fact that I was in and I was gone, he came down to uh, Daytona Beach, which is where I trained. He came down there to see me and took my friends and me all out to dinner. And it was, he was very cooperative after that. I think so. Mm -hmm. He came to see me one night. It was the night we went out to dinner. He took me back to the hotel, luxury hotel they had us in. <laughs> and um, he left and he thought, well, I'll, I'll go back by the beach. We were right on the beach. I walked back by the beach instead of the street. And uh, things were very tight then. You had blackout curtains and everything being on the Atlantic like that. And uh, a Coast Guard <laughs> caught him on the beach came charging up on a big horse and nearly frightened my father to death. I said, what are you doing on the beach this time of night? And he said, well, I've been to visit my daughter who lives right over there. But, uh, you know, he saw his identification and knew he was okay. Yes. But uh, it was, um, he didn't like it at first, though. So. Now, where did you have your basic training? Daytona? Daytona Beach, uh-huh. And what was basic training like? Uh, well, mine, we had to learn to march, of course, and... Uh, they made me do the same thing I did before I went in service. I was a secretary, which I did not want to be. But they sent me to the, uh, the school that taught me how to keep Army records uh, from company through battalions and so forth. And uh, I did the same thing, just secretarial work. Uh, the ones who were going to be cooks and bakers were sent to somewhere other than Daytona. They took them out. But, uh, but it, uh, we lived... Uh, when I first got there, we lived in tents for about two weeks, I guess. And it was sort of chilly at night, even in Florida, you know. And they had little 
little stoves sitting in the middle of the tents and we had to keep wood in them to keep us warm. I don't think they were real organized when I got there, to tell you the truth. But, it, uh, you know, it took them uh, three days to give us uniforms. And uh, what were you wearing? The same thing I rode down on in the train. Which was what? Um, I seem to remember I had on a blue wool dress and a black coat. And I was so proud of that coat. It had a little bit of mink on the collar, just a little bit. And uh, heels about like this, black suede shoes. And they had us out to keep us busy, really, uh, pulling palmettos out of the dirt around this area we were in. And I had on high heel shoes. And it was, uh, <laughs> but everybody was in the same shape I was in, though. So I, what didn't look too peculiar. Um, or any special things you let me think. Um, well, the way they did it was the the worst thing to me, and I still don't understand it real well. Was the morning report? That's I mean that's very important in a company, you know, because you have to uh, account for everybody in the company, and uh, if anybody is AWL on sick leave or whatever, that was the hardest thing I had to learn, and. Uh, but I got through it somehow. I had a bad fall while I was uh, in Daytona. Our company was in a, um, a hotel here, and there was one over here, and it was the same company, and had a little wall about this high between them. And I had to go that I was fire, fire watch one night, and you had to go the back way because you couldn't open the doors on the Atlantic side because light would shine out. And I tripped over the wall and just I had a terrible wound on my uh, shin, so uh, they sent me to sick, to sick call, and they said, okay, really that ought to have some stitches, but if we send you over to get stitches in it, you're going to miss going with your company. So I chose not to. They just taped it together, and I went with the company to Norfolk, which is good. I never would have met your dad if I hadn't gone to Norfolk, you see. Um, uh, we were, it was after work one day. The PX was un, underneath where headquarters, where my office was. I, was. I worked for the assistant port, assistant base, wait a minute, assistant port quartermaster. And uh, so after work, we would go by, and uh, usually we had a beer. <laughs> That's where I met your daddy having a beer, real weak beer like the service had. And, uh, I was with a friend of mine, and he had eyes just for her. I mean, he said, oh, hi, <laughs> and that was it. But, um, and she introduced us. And I would see him around, you know, and finally got to know him pretty good. And, uh, and what was his name? George, just George Saylor. And where was he from? Rochester, New York. And he was a military policeman there on the base. And uh, what else do I need to tell Would about you? Would you like to show the pictures? If you hold those up, we can show. Okay. Those up. Good. So that is George Saylor mm -hmm. and Margaret Denny Saylor. And what age are you in that picture? I was. I was. Two and a half, I think, when this was taken. I see. And uh, what is your rank? I was a technician fifth grade, which meant I was not a combat person. I had a specific job like secretarial or something like that. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what what was the training like once you got to Norfolk? Well the training was over then. I uh huh. I just uh, went to work every day like a nine to five job, you know, doing secretary work for Captain Tice. Now, did you do any driving? No, I had hoped I would get a job like that. And Captain Tice, who was my boss, um, made me take a, a test to get a driver's license in case I ever had to drive him anywhere. But uh, I never did. I just did secretarial work. That was all I so did. So you didn't have your driver's license prior to that? Yeah, I did. I had one in Lewis. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. so, uh, but. Um, 
Oh, there were a lot of girls there who worked in the motor pools. I envied them so, getting out of the office, you know, and doing something else. And uh, a lot of the girls in my company um, worked for the dental clinic there. The, all, the people that came through there were going overseas. They put them on boats in Norfolk and Newport News. So they had to have dental checks and so forth. And uh, so a lot of the girls worked in the dental clinic. Did you get a lot of uh, people coming from places that you knew, like Louisvillians coming from I Europe? saw one Louisvillian. He was in the Navy. He was at the Naval Air Station, and uh, he knew I was there. And I, I saw two. Bill Abbott came to visit us one night. And, uh, but that's the way it is in the service. If anybody knows you at a certain place, they make an effort, you know, to see you. And, uh, but I saw Larry Raines and uh, Bill Abbott. It, um, I met some people that I really like. I met many people that I never saw anybody like them before. You know, a varied bunch of people. Uh, some were beyond my comprehension, really. But uh, you could just about pick the kind of friends you wanted, and that's the people you went with. But it, it was nice. Did you stay in touch with uh, with these friendships? That, that For a while, I stayed in touch with uh, one of the girls, uh -huh. and uh, and sort of with another one. But uh, my husband's best friend was stationed there with him, and we have stayed in touch with him until his death in Augusta, what about five years ago? We always stayed in touch with him, and. Uh, our children stayed in touch with each other, sort of. Now, I'd like to ask, what about the food and so forth? Were you affected? I had no objection to the food. It was pretty good. Uh, our WAC company had its own dining hall, its own uh, day room, its own beauty parlor, everything, you know. So, And it, it was not, the food was good. I had no objection to it whatsoever. And did you, me, did you write to your, what kind of correspondence did you have with your family? Could you tell if they were Rationing. Very much so, mm -hmm. very much so. Uh, in fact, my father planted a garden. Oh, good. He good. kept some chickens, good. which he could never kill. He couldn't kill them after raising them. <laughs> but uh, they were very much affected. I remember my dad writing me and saying, if you can possibly find a good fountain pen in the PX, mm -hmm. I sure would appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I did find one, but they were hard to kill. Anything with metal in it, mm -hmm. you know, was hard to find then. But was the mail pretty good? Were you able to correspond? Mm -hmm. to no problem at all with the mail. So uh, I guess it's just the people who were overseas who had problems yes. with mail. But uh, we had no problem. What was the job you hated the most you told me about? Oh. The most? oh, when we were in training in Daytona. Kitchen duty, washing Ooh. pots and pans. Oh, the, um, the dining hall there was in the basement of this huge, huge hotel. We were not ba uh, billeted there, but we had our meals there. And it was down in the basement. And I told Denny, I just, when I was faced with this first huge aluminum thing with a big whisk that went round and round, I didn't quite know what it was. It was a potato whipper, you know, mashed potatoes. But, uh, and as soon as you washed them, they were back again to be washed again. It was just sort of a endless thing. And they got me a lot, too. Uh, I think they got their records mixed up for a while. But being a D, I was at the head of the alphabet, and they would come in, OK, Denny, you on PX today, <laughs> KP today. And I hated that. I hated yeah. it real bad. Well, what was the hotel like? You were billeted in a hotel. What did they do to it for the wartime? Uh, they took all the curtains down. All the, well, they had shades on the Atlantic side. But everything was pretty much stripped down. We had cots instead of beds. And um, I remember the room that we stayed in, it was at an apartment hotel, a nice place. The room that my cot was in had mirrors all over one wall around this beautiful fireplace, but uh, took the rugs up, just bare floors. Everything was very what about your laundry situation? You were telling me about oh. that. Well, some ladies came from somewhere. I, I'm sure they had made arrangements, but they would come and pick up our laundry and um, then bring it back the next Saturday, and we could be waiting for them. There. And they never got it mixed up. 
I, I always got my same things back. And, they were civilians, right? Yeah, they were civilian ladies around the area down there. Uh -huh. And uh, they did have a laundry. I remember when they took, finally gave us uh, uniforms, they took us over to be measured for shoes. And so these, these were male soldiers who were fitting the shoes for us. So they wouldn't have to stoop over all day. They had this huge platform and we went up the steps and sat on the platform so they could stand up straight while they were measuring our feet. And um, my shoes were too short until I got to Norfolk and they gave me two more pair that fit better. Maybe that's why I have problems today, Denny. Did they ever have any problems with um, soldiers being too fresh with you since women were in the Army now? Did you have Oh, I'm sure there were a lot. Uh, they'd Did make remarks as we walked by, you know. And, uh, but, you know, you just ignore them, that's all. Just ignore them. Did you hear of any difficulties in your unit? Uh, no. You know, there was one, one woman who came back. She showed up for breakfast Sunday morning, if I remember. I can't remember her name even. But she had two black eyes, and I, I never knew where this person got her two black eyes. Didn't hurt her, or just two black eyes. And they tried to keep it quiet, whatever happened to her. I think you got quite an education when you went down there. You had not seen so many different yeah. types of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, in a little small town like Louisville, uh, we didn't drink too. We didn't drink at all, period. The, and uh, I saw a lot of that. And uh, How long were you in the service? Two and a half years. Uh-huh. And... Uh, I went in in 42. I went in, uh, I got out in 44. I was in two years, just two years. My son was born in, De in 44, yeah, November of 44. So, and I got out when my uniforms didn't fit anymore. That's when I got out. <laughs> Well, um, right up the uh, right up the corridor from us was the uh, base adjutant. His name was Captain Cute, C U I T E. He was a funny man. I liked him a lot, and uh, so I went and asked him how long I could stay in after having a physical and everything. He said, "As long as you want to, just let me know, and I'll get the papers in motion when you want to get out." So I stayed as long as I could button my sh skirt, you know. And it was, um, everybody was very sweet and considerate. Um, now, when you asked for permission to get married, who'd you ask that from? My company commander, mm -hmm. Pauline Payton. Mm -hmm. I remember her name. Did she give you a quiz? Well, she sure. said to me, oh, well, of course you have my permission. I was going home on leave. But what are you going to do with that good-looking MP you are dating? And I said, I'm taking him with me, and we're going to get married. Tell us about that situation when That's you took Dad story. home. What was that? When you took Dad home to Louisville that weekend. Yeah. That's the weekend you got married, wasn't it? Yeah. Well. I was home for a week. Had he ever been home before? No. They, they had never met him. And, uh, Did I'm they know about him? Oh yeah, I had I had told them that we were coming down to get married, and uh, but it was an experience for him too. Believe me, <laughs> all the family coming around to take a good look at him. Well, what was it like getting married then in wartime? Were you still able to have? We we had a very small wedding. In fact, we were married by the justice. Uh, she was a judge of the court of the ordinary, and she was my one of my mother's best friends. So she married us. And uh, after we got back to Norfolk, uh, we were, had another ceremony, a Catholic ceremony. George was Catholic. And so we had a church. Well, we, we were in the church, but it wasn't a big wedding, you know, just some well, where, friends. Where did the wedding take place in Louisville? In, the living, in Phil's living room. Who was there? Well, Jessica, the judge, Mama and Daddy, Billy and Phil, Nanny, and of course, my mother was crying, 
And my younger brother, who was all of 17, then said, I don't see why everybody's crying. This is supposed to be a happy occasion. But Mama cried at all weddings. Was Dad nervous? Your dad was never nervous. Uh, if he was, he didn't show it. He just, but um, he, he liked it, Dad. He, had, he stayed after he got out of the Army. And, uh, now, he was an uh, uh, officer at that time, or was he still enlisted? He was an officer. Uh, right soon after I left to come home, he went to uh, New Orleans to officer candidate school and uh, then went back to uh, another port of embarkation, Boston port of embarkation. And, uh, were you able to be together, or were you separated? Pretty so much together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we were allowed to live off the base after we got back to Norfolk, if we wanted to. Um, usually we would just spend weekends and have some friends over or something, but during the week it was too hard to get back to the base from where we had this place, so. But we saw each other every day. We were never separated. Now, after you left the WAC, mm -hmm. was it uh, just a smooth transition back to married life, or was it difficult to change? Well, actually, change? we had had such a strange kind of married life. Um, and when, uh, when I got out, I went back to my mother's house. That's where I was when my son was born, and stayed there until George got out of OCS. And um, things went fairly smoothly. Um, Did you have any feeling that it was difficult for women to go back into traditional life after having been in the military? Uh, not the ones I knew down there. It was just an easy transition. They went back to doing the same things they did before. They had served the country and mm -hmm, they went mm -hmm. back to... The and most of them were my age, so most of them were not married, so they just went back in the jobs they had before. Did any of them stay in? No, none of my, uh, no, none of them stayed in. Uh -uh. In fact, we didn't have a choice then. When the war was over and things were winding down, you got out. And, uh, but they can stay now. With big families, they can be in service now. So. What about the camaraderie among the, all the women, the, the friendships, the well, it, it, good spirit. Uh -huh. It was nice. In fact, I enjoyed living. Each, each one of our platoons had a barracks, and uh, I enjoyed being in there. Uh, one girl, Marjorie something, had an accordion, and she would play the accordion at night after we went back to the barracks. And uh, it was nice. Um, and it's funny, I can't remember those girls' names now. Isn't that awful that I forget? <laughs> but uh, it was nice. And before I met George, and even after I met him, he had duty a lot on Saturdays that he couldn't, I couldn't date him then. So I would stay in the barracks and read. <coughs> and then every night at 10, <coughs> I would hear taps being played from the Navy base down the street. And it was, it was real nice. You know, quiet, nobody talking, and I could hear taps at night. And uh, but I, I have no idea what has become of all of those girls. Just the two that I kept in touch with. Well, we might be able to find out someday. Maybe mm -hmm. some records will turn mm -hmm. up. Um, I remember one girl, Lucy Rafferty. She was from Bakersfield, California. I remember her. And uh, she, I know she never had a serious thought in her life, and I imagine she's still the same kind of, if she's still alive, but she was fun. Well, you had mentioned another type of girl you hadn't met before, hadn't known about. Well, don't, let's not go into that, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, what about, you know a lot about World War II now, but what did you know of how the war was going while you were in service? What kind of information did you get? Well, the, anything that was in Newsweek or Life or things like that. But um, when you, at least when I was there, your world was so little. It was your world was the base you were living in, mm -hmm. and uh, what are the movies tonight? Is there a softball game and so forth? We really got a smattering of what the 
the general war was doing. I know one funny thing. Captain Tice, the man I worked for, <coughs> had been in the First World War. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, he was sort of a, he was pretty strict, really. One day, walking home from the office back to the barracks, there was a softball game going over in a big field I had to go by. And a ball came at me. And I naturally put my hands up. And it hit me and broke this finger. Well, I went to the uh, doctor about it. And when I went back in on Monday morning, he was so mad with me. That impaired my typing a good bit, you know, with this splint on my finger. It's your own fault. You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> well, you were out of service when the bombs were dropped mm -hmm. on Japan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> out back then. But do you have an impression of how, your, what were your thoughts? My you thoughts were, thank goodness this ends it, you know. And no more people, because we knew what it was going to be like if Americans had to invade Japan. And that, I was glad to hear that that would not be. Mm -hmm. And then people started coming home. So uh, I didn't think too much about what it did to Japan. Mm -hmm. I, would just, I was still mad at them. Yeah. <laughs> so. What about when Roosevelt died? Oh, that was, that was... Uh, real rough several days. I was at home then. Warren was just a little baby. And my mother and I, and somebody else was with us. But we were sitting in front of the radio and television crying, you know. And my dad came home. He worked in the post office one day. And he walked in. He looked at us. He said, if you women are going to continue to cry about this, I'm not going to come home. And he turned around and walked out. Went, of course, he came home. But, uh, <clears throat> How close did the train come to Louisville, coming from? Not anywhere near it. Not anywhere near, Not anywhere near it, no. Um, the nearest it got was Warm Springs, of course, and it went north after that. But, uh, what did you, what's your impression, as you remember, about the feeling of patriotism among your generation and your age group? Well, that. I think it's what made us all join. We really felt very patriotic. And uh, I sometimes think that as, as a whole, we'll never feel that patriotic again. But uh, it was patriotism, I, I like to tell myself. But. Uh, well, it was certainly a unique time with everybody pulling together, rationing, mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. things we can't even imagine. When I went home on leave, I went home on two leaves before I got out. Uh, well, I had pneumonia after I got to Norfolk, so I had to stay in the hospital a month, and then they sent me home for a while. But I had to go to the ration board and get show them my leave papers, and they gave me stamps for whatever, so I would they wouldn't have to use the family's meat stamps and canned goods stamps for me, you see. And. Uh, by then, Jean was out, so she was working in the ration office in Louisville. Why did she get out? Her mother was dying of cancer, and when the, we became the WAC instead of the WAAC. Now, who is Jean? Jean Clark. And she's the one you joined up with in Atlanta, mm -hmm. Fort McPherson. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, How long were you at Fort McPherson? Uh, actually, just two days. My, fortunately, my aunt lived in Atlanta, and we could stay with her. And the uh, first day, we went out to Fort Mac for um, physicals. The next day, mental exams and being sworn in. That was very touching. You know, this whole room full of girls, all with their right hands raised, you know. But uh, just two days we were out there. And then you were released to go back home. Go home until up. we get called. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Then what happened after that? We got on the train in Macon and went to Daytona. <laughs> I, just, I worked until, you know, they called me to come. And uh, Were your drill instructors really harsh or did they make any consideration the fact that you guys were completely out of your depth? I, I guess. I, I don't remember too well, really. They were all females. We didn't have any male drill instructors. And uh, we, our first sergeant, though, she had the prettiest 
face I've ever seen. She, her name was Cron. She was very Irish. She had the prettiest face, prettiest complexion. But she was big. And I think she had to wear a girdle, I'm not sure, but she took little mincy steps. And when she was leading the to do, <laughs> taking those little steps, we were trying to take little steps too. It was sort of difficult. Um, about all I can think of that happened. As I said, my life was very uneventful and awful. I did see a lot of um, soldiers, a lot of officers who came in to our headquarters. Uh, as I would be going in, I'd see them coming up. I never knew what countries they were from, from even. They had very colorful uniforms and a lot of red on them. I, I saw a lot of British coming in. but. Uh, Uh, oh, another thing, they housed some uh, German soldiers, prisoners of war for a while. And one day I was walking from the mess hall over to my barracks, and there were soldiers guarding the prisoners. They were working on the street in front of me. And I just was going to walk straight across, and this soldier, American show, yelled at me, don't, 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 don't get between me and them. And I had to walk way around, you know. And we had a lot of Italian. POWs who were housed there, getting ready to send them somewhere else. And they were one happy group. You just couldn't be mad at them. They took over the, um, the theater one night. They decided they were going to the movies, and they weren't allowed to go to movies. But they just simply walked out of their barracks and walked over to the movie and had to be rounded up and taken back again. Um, These were the Uh-huh. They didn't... They didn't seem to be taking it very seriously at all. <laughs> Did they make a lot of noise when the girls would walk by? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, let's see what else could When happen. you were uh, in Daytona, since you were on the beach, did you ever hear uh, any noise like out at sea? Oh yeah, uh-huh. Like what? Either bombarding or something getting hit, uh, but there were big lawns out in front of these places, and they would hold our classes a lot of days, just let us sit out on the lawn and have classes, and we could sit there and hear the, I guess, submarines out. I don't know what, the, you know, the bombing was out there. And, uh, but they got very upset if we opened those blackout curtains on the Atlantic side at night. Did you feel like you got any useful training, or did it primarily use the skills you had already developed? Primarily the skill I'd already developed. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they tried to do, mm -hmm. give you something that you already knew how to do, which made sense, that's you know, rather than have to train me again. And uh, But I had taken shorthand when I was in business school, but I never used it much, and I really used it in Norfolk, just all day, every day sometime. And there was a young civilian girl who was in our office also, she lived there. Her shorthand was so perfect that if she didn't show up one day, I could take her book and transcribe from her shorthand. It was just, Amazing. it was just perfect. Um, That's a great skill. It is. Of course, now they don't need it anymore, but back then it was much in demand. with any of the soldiers overseas? Oh, yeah. Um, some of the men who were overseas from uh, Joe Cox, uh, Donald, a whole bunch of them, you know. They wanted to keep in touch with anybody from home, you see. Where was Joe's? Joe was in the Pacific. Donald was in the Pacific. Uh, everybody was in the Pacific that I knew, I think, except me. Um, and they could tell you just so much. They couldn't be too explicit about what was going on, where they were. And, uh, but they, most of them came back to Louisville and just picked up where they left off. Now, Uncle Billy, he joined in before you got out or after? When was that? Uh, 
He was at Emory at Oxford. How old were he? He was very, very young. He was 17. Mama had to sign for him to join the Navy. And um, that was in Second World War. Then when Korea came along, he was drafted for the Army then. So. This is your brother? My brother. Uh -huh. What did he do in the Navy? Well, that's sort of a story, too. My aunt, Aunt Lillian in Virginia one day, uh, were going to California. So they said, oh, good, we'll see Billy. And uh, they went to Shoemaker, California, and it was a correctional institution the Navy had. So they went and said, uh, my nephew Bill Denny is here. We'd like to see him. And they said, oh, no, we don't have anybody by that name. They, wouldn't, they didn't want to tell anybody that he was in jail or anything. But he was just, he wasn't. He was part of the, the clerical group that ran this place. But they never got to see him, and he was there. But they just said, oh, no, nobody by that name here. That was Willis F. Denny, the fifth, or the fourth? Four. Willis F. Denny, the fourth. But um, he, um, I guess he enjoyed it. He was allergic to his uniform. Oh, yeah, he was allergic to wool. And having to wear wool navy uniforms it makes me itch to think about it too. It was pretty difficult for him. Um, I wish I could think of something interesting to tell you. Tell me a little bit more about. I had a question. Had your father served in the? Army? He he was in the navy in the First World War. Uh huh. And uh, well, I think the fact women in service was so new to people that's what he objected to so much. And uh, he, he just could not see it at all. Just could not. But then he accepted that. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Right. And can you tell me about the Victory Garden, or a little bit more of the home life? Of the well, I wasn't there that much when all that was going on. But uh, he, he had a, a Victory Garden so they wouldn't have to buy canned goods. And uh, he bought two turkeys. I remember he bought two turkeys and um, named them Margaret and George. <laughs> so they were to kill one of the turkeys for when we came home on leave to get married, and they couldn't do it. They just could not kill the turkeys. I don't know what finally happened to them. Um, but we were fortunate uh, in that we were in a rural area, and fresh things were easy to come by. And, uh, and what did Grandfather Denny do. What was his job? Yeah. He worked in the post office. He was a money order clerk in the post office there. And <laughs> he would write me. Uh, a postcard came today, I'll say, for, for Mr. Cox from Joe. And Joe said so and so and so on the postcard. He'd read them all and then write me <laughs> what was going on. But I'm glad I joined. It, it was interesting. It was an experience. It really was. Um, but I can understand why my father was so against it. I had hardly ever been out of that little small South Georgia town. So he, they were concerned about how I would survive in the whole thing. And, uh, but you were with a bunch of women who were in the same situation. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Very much so. All sorts of different people. Did some of them just, what was it like in the barracks? Did some of the girls cry when they first got there, missing home? Or uh, you would hear a few sniffles at night after the lights went out. I think they were a little bit homesick. I was homesick, too. But the, everybody was just so different. So different. Did they come from all parts of the country? All parts of the country. Um, I was thankful that I got sent to Daytona Beach for training instead of Port Des Moines, Iowa, because it was cold as a dickens out there at the time I would have been there. And, uh, but I guess, no. I started to say, I guess the people that side of Mississippi went to Fort Des Moines and we went to um, Daytona Beach, but Lucy Rafferty was from California and she went to Daytona Beach for training. I don't know what their logic was in that. But, uh, Probably housing. Could be, could be. And there were some people 
who never, never could learn their right foot from their left foot. <laughs> but, you know, Kron was patient with him. It almost seemed like a dream. I wasn't really there. It's been so long. It's been 60 years, hadn't it? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, as we come to the to the 60th anniversary, as we think about that, do you have any thoughts for the younger people now? Today? Um. Well, we were just so different then, and the services are so different now too. Uh, women serve right along with the men, as you know, from Iraq, you know, they are in it just as much as the men. And uh, there was never any question of our being sent into combat, no question at all, they never would. Uh, some of the people in our company went to uh, Tunisia. Is that the country or is Tunis the country? Tunisia is the country, isn't it? Uh, some of them were sent there after I left. They were um, oh, communication specialists. I forget the name of the thing they worked on so much. But some of them did get sent overseas. But uh, that's all I can think of, folks. You really served your country. Well, you what you could do to well, I, I I felt like that's what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and you were brave, and it was quite an adventure. It was. It was. I felt sort of bad because the person I replaced in Captain Tice's office was a civilian. You know, I was thinking I would replace a, a man to go overseas, but the person I replaced in his office was a civilian lady. Hmm. Interesting. Uh -huh. Did you find that the officers, the, the women officers who were training you, were they well qualified and um, worthy of your respect. So oh, I, I very much so. I respected them both. Uh, our um, Captain Payton was the commanding officer, and the woman, what, what's the one underneath the commanding officer? Assistant, whatever. Anyway, uh, she was considerably older than Captain Payton, and uh, she she was very nice, motherly type. I liked her. But um, it was surprising how many people, how many of the officers um, were married and had grown children, and they just, you know, went back in after the children grew up. But I'm sure they wanted the mature people to be the officers, sure. to ride herd on all of us. Um, hmm, what else is new up there? Can't think of anything else. So, very basically, but why did they want you to keep the curtains closed on the Atlantic side? So that enemy submarines out there couldn't see. The Atlantic coast never got bombed, never. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they didn't want the light from the shore to mm -hmm. shine out to sea. Just in case. Just in case, and also if there were. Uh, our ships were out there, and say a submarine was on the other side, it would be silhouetted against the lights on shore, you see. And that was the reason we had the black oil cloth. But, um, and I'm sure they did the same thing on the Pacific Coast, too. So. Why don't you tell us the names of all your children, because I think we've... My children? Okay. The oldest one is George Warren Saylor. He's 59 now. He was regular army. He got out of it after 22 years. He lives in Germany now. And my next one was Philip Saylor. Uh, he lives in the Atlanta area. And Michael Saylor, who lives in Baton Rouge. And Margaret Denny Saylor, who lives not too far from me in Stone Mountain. And Mary Saylor. They live together, my youngest daughter and my oldest daughter. So uh, I've been fortunate in that at least three of them live close to me. Um, I think you're getting mentioned your one wish that you regret had been that you didn't take advantage of the GI Bill. Uh, really, I, I didn't take advantage of that, and I wish I had. Uh, 
but I, it just never occurred to me at the time. I had a little baby, you know, and, War and George was wanting to go to school, so it was just sort of out of the question for me to uh, take advantage of the education thing. My dad was taking advantage of the GI Bill. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. He did, yes. you know, after he got out. And, and he used to have to get through college. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. He went to tech. Oh, uh, right. He went to school in California for a short while uh, and decided that what he was studying was not for him. So he came back to tech. And uh, we lived here while he was at tech. In fact, we've been living here just about ever since. We hardly left at all. So he graduated from He did not graduate. Um, he, I don't know how far along he was even, but he had a stomach ulcer. And the doctor said, you can either uh, get out of school and get from under pressure like you are, and uh, said you can't work and go to school too. Can't work and support your family and go to school. You got to give up one. So of course he had to support the family. So he he got out of school. But my youngest son graduated from tech. Uh, but back then you didn't have to necessarily graduate. You, you could have your training and that's what he did. Continue. Well he got some good training at tech that he used in, in jobs, mm -hmm. you know. Um, he did mention uh, what was his recollection of what it was like going back to school with a bunch of other veterans at oh. Tech. Well, we, we lived out at the Lawson Apartments out in Chambly. We all, they were all veterans then. And it was so funny, all of these boys would just be shaking their heads. They were taking it so seriously. They'd been through the war and they really wanted to go to school and everything. But the freshmen coming in you know, it didn't mean as much to them. It was just like two different groups completely going to tech. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then did you settle then here in Atlanta? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. We lived uh, for a short while in Daytona, uh, not Daytona, Clearwater, uh, which was nice. But George always in the back of it and lived for a year in uh, North Carolina. Well, that was before he went to school. Okay. But anyway, he always, in the back of his mind, always, I must get back to Atlanta. This is where he wanted to be. It's the way I wanted to be, too. He liked being that Yankee in the midst of all the Southerners. Right. He really liked it. Mm -hmm. He was good. Mm -hmm. So he became a Southerner. Very much so. I remember him saying once, you know, I was young then, but said, right now, I could not go back to that snowy place between Rochester and Syracuse and across that way was the snow belt and he said I, I just I couldn't put up with it I couldn't stand it and the lifestyle here in the south really mm -hmm. enjoyed mm -hmm. a lot slower pace mm -hmm. he liked it and has he passed away when, when he passed away in December 2000 he had Alzheimer's disease it was a a long, hard time for him, um, but um, he had retired, you know, from, he worked for J.C. Penney for a number of years, and he had retired, and uh, very soon after, discovered he had Alzheimer's. Um, but you and Mary were big help with him, though, I remember that, yeah. We try to quiz him on his wartime experiences, but sometimes being military police, he he was a gregarious person normally, but sometimes you could not pull things out of him. And some of his wartime experience was undercover on the docks of New York. And uh -huh. so slowly some of these things would leak out and he'd just say it like he didn't you know that? It was like, no, tell us more, tell us more. You know, undercover in the docks yeah. of New York during the war with the with the black market and everything. Um, so he survived, so I guess yes. he must have been good at what he did. <laughs> that was unusual. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't I, we can turn off the tape and think if there's anything else you want to add. Okay. Just take a break okay. and, and uh -huh. see if there's something else you want to review. Okay. All right, now we can, what were you saying about your 
friends in Louisville. 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 Well, you know, as I was saying, uh, life in a small town, Louisville, was very pleasant. In fact, we didn't even know there was a depression when there was a depression, you know. But it was very pleasant as long as the people I went to school with and grew up with were there. But as they started joining the different services and leaving, it got pretty, pretty dull. And um, I'm glad I went. I'm glad I went. I really am. And, uh, However, when your daughter talked about joining the services, how did you feel about that? Well, I wanted you to finish school and get your profession in order. I didn't want you to do that then. Because I think the GI Bill was over by then, wasn't it? There came a time when I couldn't use it anymore. After y'all got a little bit older, I couldn't use it, you see. Um, but I'm, I'm glad you didn't, because you're here with me now to take <laughs> care of me. <laughs> and a history teacher. Mm -hmm. I, I thought, I like history and have always liked it. And I thought I knew a lot of things, but I can make remarks. And Denny says, oh, no, it wasn't like that at all. This, 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 this she straightens me out. Compared to what I had done before, yeah, it was an adventure. It really was. And, uh, well, we're glad you did it. And well, I'm glad too. Thank you for your and I'm glad I came over here today. I, I didn't want to, too. but I'm glad I did. And I'm glad you did. I'm glad you listened to Margaret. So thank you for coming very much. Well, I, I appreciate you having us, and you've been a very good interviewer because I feel at ease. I'm not hiding under the table. This is your story. <laughs> your time. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you.